So thank you so much. Thank you, Lord. Be with us. Open the scriptures for us. Give us a revelation. Give us understanding. We want to know you more and more. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you don't mind, please turn with me to the prophet Zechariah. And uh, I promise you that we're going to make it. We're still in chapter 1. And uh, yesterday we looked at the first vision about uh, that Zechariah saw. And the first vision was about a man in, 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 in a white horse. So we, we just want to come to that. But before you go to the second vision, then we come to a parenthesis. You know, after the vision, there is a, there's a section. There's a section that actually deals with uh, something that happened out of the, of the vision. And then the Lord has uh, certain promises that he gives these people. I want us to look at that. I want us to look at that in Jesus' name. Okay, brothers, just hold on. Just hold on. Don't get lost. We are, we are looking at the vision of um, Zechariah. You see, we saw in our last session that there was a man on a red horse. When we looked closer, the man was walking among the myrtle trees. And these trees represent the house of Israel, the nation of Israel, as it were. And uh, it is in that vision that God was revealing to us yesterday as we spoke that he is in the midst of his people. God walks and God operates in the midst of his people, among his people. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Right now, as we are in that chapter, the children of Israel are in exile. Now, that's why when you read Zechariah, you get a lot of confusion because some of the prophecies refer to Israel still in Babylon like the vision of the red horse uh, the ride of the red horse is about israel still in babylon still um under captivity and so god brings to them that vision and the underlying message is that god is with us even in the babylonian captivity god never sent his people into captivity and then he sat back no, God sent them to captivity, but God accompanied them there. That's why you find Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were able to undergo the 70 years and they were present with the Lord. Just something small to encourage us. It doesn't matter. Even when we are under divine punishment, even when we are under divine rebuke, God is with us during the discipline. God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. The Lord is with us. Whether you are down or up, as you go through trouble, God is with us. He's present with us and is a present help in the time of need. Now, the vision ended in, as you've read, in verse 11 of chapter 1. The vision ends when the angel who stood among the myrtle trees uh, asked the angels that had been sent. So you see, it was the Lord himself asking the angels that he had sent and is asking them, what did you find out on the earth? Remember when he's asking this question, Israel is in captivity. Israel is in bondage. And while they're in bondage, uh, 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 God, God sends angels to the rest of the world. And he says to them, and this is very important for us, that the whole world is at peace. The earth is comfortable. The earth has no problem. They have no challenge with Israel being in captivity. In fact, at that time, Israel ceased to be a nation. It was not a nation. And these messengers that are sent from the Lord brought a word that the whole world is at peace. You see, sometimes Israel has been seen as the problem in the world. The Middle East, the thorn in the flesh of the United Nations, is what to do with Israel. So having dislocated Israel and taken them into bondage and destroyed Jerusalem and brought down the temple, uh, the rest of the nations of the world said, we are now at peace. At least the problem that has bordered the whole world, the problem has disappeared. We have dealt with it finally. 
and you realize that uh, during the Second World War, uh, what Hitler was harping on was this funny issue about the Jewish solution. And he was providing the world with a solution to the Jewish problem. To date, Israel still remains a problem to the world, and Jerusalem is still a thorn in the flesh to the world. And that's why whenever Israel wants to relocate their national headquarters to Jerusalem, the whole world begins to have an uproar. And so these angels who are sent out gave the word and said, Oh, the world is at peace. The world is relaxed. So long as Israel is in trouble, the rest of the world can sit pretty. Do you know that is true with the church of God? Every time the world finds a place to silence the church and to send the church into the backwaters, then the world feels safe. Because the church is the conscience. The church is that which nags the mind of the world. The church reminds the world of their sinfulness. But it's not, not true with those who are born again. If you are born again and you work in a situation where your colleagues are not born again, you sort of get isolated because you're a thorn in the flesh. You don't take bribes when your colleagues take bribes. You don't do things that your colleagues are doing. And you become a pariah. And if they can sort you out, if they can incriminate you, if they can nail you, then they feel safe. They feel fine. Nobody reminds them that what they are doing is sinful. Now, these angels brought a word that the earth is at peace because Israel is in exile. And the angel that spoke to Zachariah cried out, if you read your Bible, I have to balance my left hand, but the angel cried out and said, O oh Lord my God, how long will you be angry with your people? You are angry with us for 70 years, and you said you will take us into exile for 70 years. Oh dear Lord, the 70 years are over. Please, Lord, do something. How long, Lord? I look at that verse and I remind myself that when Daniel was also in exile, he took the books, history books, prophetic books, and Daniel began to study the books. Blessed be the name of the Lord for brothers and sisters who like studying the books who likes studying the Bible. I'm not talking about the lazy Christian who has to wait for somebody to regurgitate for them the Bible every Sunday. I am not talking about the shallow believer who depends on things they pick on the streets and phrases they are picked on the way. I'm talking about 2 Timothy 2. Study to show yourself a workman approved of God. Daniel was a man who studied the Bible and he studied the books, not one book, but several books. And after studying the books, he realized that the time of the punishment into Babylon had come to an end. He understood by reading, not depending on some packing lot prophet, but he understood from personal study and conviction that the time of Israel's punishment, 70 years had elapsed. So what did uh, Daniel do? He began to intercede and remind God that 70 years are over, dear Lord. Will you not now remember Israel and do good to it? Let me just share with you something on that line. That it is, it is important for you to note that the time for Israel's captivity had come to an end. The prophetic season had ended. But it takes men and women of God who understand the times to pray so that God's will can be fulfilled at the end of the times. What is this scripture telling us? If we don't have men and women who understand the times, and they are able to pray appropriately. Then the time 70 years can pass, and even 8 years without the captivity coming to an end, because someone has to stand in the gap in prayer and fasting 
and waiting to bridge heaven and earth for the miracle to take place. What am I saying? It is possible that God can give you a promise. But you see, if God gives you a promise, then it requires you and me to understand the timing of that promise and to pray that that promise may be fulfilled in our time. So what if we don't pray? If we don't pray, the miracle will be abort. If we don't pray, the miracle might be still born. You see, 70 years are over. God is angry with Israel. But how long? There are brothers and sisters watching this message. And they have in their lives that question. How long? I've waited since God promised to give me a miracle. How long, O oh Lord? It has taken long. Maybe someone gave you a prophetic word and told you at the end of this year, you will experience a miracle. That year came and passed and nothing happened. And you're asking, how long? You want to say that prophet was a false prophet. Now let me tell you something because we are now getting deep and I'm sure we are not carrying everyone along with us. God spoke to the children of Israel. In fact, he said to Jacob that your descendants will go and be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years. But guess what? Israel took 416 years. What were the 16 years for? The 16 years God had to find a man who understood the times. That man was Moses. Could it be possible that your miracle, your promise, could be 16 years late? Because someone has to connect heaven and earth. Somebody has to translate the promise into a tangible miracle. The timing of God goes hand in hand with the spirit of prayer. Now let me just remind you that the Bible talks about intercessors. And Isaiah says, those who call on the name of the Lord, give him no rest, give him no peace, give him no slumber, until he restores Israel and makes it a praise in the whole earth. There is the divine act and the human responsibility that the intercessors, the men and women of prayer, will bring the hand of God. And the restoration of Jerusalem is depending on the perfect, uh, effectual, intensive, sustained prayer until Jerusalem is a praise in the whole earth. You see, my dear brothers, do you remember our father, the patriarch Abraham? God told him, I'll give you a son. Abraham did not sit back lazily to wait for a son. God gave the promise. Abraham had to believe proactively. If you study your Bible, there is no time that Abraham ever met with God and he never raised the issue of Isaac with the Lord. Every time God met with Abraham, Abraham said, Lord, you promised me a baby. When is that baby coming? You see, he kept reminding God. He did sacrifices and sacrifices. He was faithful to God. And in his persistence, one time he told God, you come here every day and talk to me about this child. I'm growing old and is a, a slave born in my house, Eliaza, is going to inherit my property. You see, he was reminding God. That is a man of the father of all the faithful. And we can learn from him. Now, Daniel, when he understood the time had come, he also understood that he had to bring it down. He had to bring the promises down by neology, by prayer. Theology will expose us to the promise of God, but neology will bring 
the promise of God. There's a rumor in town that uh, uh, the tallest man on earth is the one who can touch heaven while kneeling down in prayer. That is the tallest man. Let me tell you something, saints. Everything that God promised you, you love to actuate it. You love to make it real by coming down in prayer. You pray it down. Yesterday I was a bit harsh, but I spoke about the lazy men and the lazy women of our days who would like to cram some promises that were given to people. There are hundreds of Christians that are masquerading as people that God gave a promise, but God has never given you a personal promise. There are people who are depending on what God is saying to people about them, but God has never spoken to them. I challenge you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, buy knee cups for prayer. Every promise that God gives us will be incubated and birthed in prayer. If we don't have strong knees, if we don't have agonizing hearts, if we don't like empty stomachs, our miracles will be stillborn. We'll be left with phrases. We'll be left with a few lines that we throw in and there, but nothing tangible. Every man and woman in the Bible worth his salt was a man and a woman of prayer. I challenge you in the name of Jesus. The 70 years are over, but Zechariah has to cry out to God in prayer. Daniel has to cry out to God in prayer. Maybe your miracle is overdue. Maybe your miracle is to bring it down in prayer. Dear brothers and sisters, this man of God labored in prayer. He traveled in prayer. I want to praise God for those wonderful days in the 80s where we tarried in the presence of God. When men prayed, when evangelists, when preachers prayed, when men and women agonized in prayer. Thank God for grace. Thank God for loving Jesus. But we are living in a time when God's people, both ministers of the gospel and believers, are feeling so nice. We are nicer than Jesus. We are so gracious. We know everything in the scriptures. We have a form of godliness, but there's no power. Actually, the Bible says that we deny the power. The gospel of Christ is not words. It's not a nice suit. It's not a presentation. It's not the PowerPoint. It's the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. And that power is found in neology. That power is found in prayer. You know, this man of God prayed. How long, oh God? Oh, I, I can hear that cry. 70 years are over. Another year is going extra. And this servant of God, the prophet of God is saying, How long, oh God? I'm hearing the cry of another prophet who cried and said, Lord, Habakkuk said, In the midst of the years, Lord, revive thy work again. Oh, we want to, we are having a generation of singers, of worshippers, of performers and uh, we name it, my brothers. But we are the men. We are the women who bear the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the people that are praying that the kingdom may come in great power and authority. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We are the men who will pray down the miracles. Men like David, men of prayer, they brought down Goliath. Elijah, a man of prayer, he brought down Jezebel. Daniel, a man of prayer, overturned the rulings of kings while in Babylon. This man prayed. How long? Somebody told me push means pray until something happens. I want to ask you, 
May God's people go back and fill the prayer houses again. May we fill the prayer corner again. May our tears come back to us again. May we once more roll in the dust of the earth, go to the mountains and the caves to tarry before the Lord our God. God heard his prayer. And in a response to this prayer, oh my God, God responds to prayer. You're saying, Pastor Elisha, that's the Old Testament. Yes, it is the Old Testament. But Jesus says to us in the New Testament that there's a woman who was going to a judge so that she may obtain mercy and justice. And she kept going and went again and went again and again. And she went and she went and again she went and the, the judge did not help, help her, but she went again. Then the judge did not help and she went again until the judge said, if I don't give this woman justice, I might never have peace. Jesus said, hear what this wicked judge is saying. How much more shall your father in heaven answer those who seek him? The question is how much more when you pray? How much more? How much more? Oh, men of prayer, men who persist in prayer and insist in prayer. The question is not whether God will answer them, but how much more? Glory to God, how much more? How much more? How much more? And then he gave the, this parable. To teach them that men ought to pray. Men ought to pray. Hebrews chapter 5, New Testament, he says that Jesus, when he was in this body, he prayed with such agonizing cries and tears. And he groaned in prayer. Now, the Son of God groaned in prayer, shed tears in prayer. He woke up early when men had slept and he prayed. Late in the night he prayed a whole night. And Christ was and is God. And if Christ could pray a whole night, if Christ would wake up in the morning to pray, and you claim that you are under grace, you don't wake up in the morning to pray, that you don't fast because you are under grace, you are a disgrace to this calling. God have mercy on you. prayed. Jesus prayed. Paul writing to the Philippians, he talks about a man called Epaphrodites. As he said, he is laboring day and night, agonizing in prayer for you. Paul tells another church that you are my children and I'm in labor pains, agonizing in prayer and fasting and waiting until Christ is formed in you. Agonizing in prayer. How long, oh Lord, this man was agonizing in prayer. Zachariah was agonizing in prayer. And the answer came with six promises. Actually, seven promises that I want to close with. When you pray, God will respond to prayer. When God responds to prayer, it's beyond what we asked for or imagined. God's answers are beyond our prayers. Number one, God said, I'll be jealous for my land. I'll punish the nations that have punished Israel. I was angry with them and I handed them over to be punished, but the nations exceeded their limit. The Israel. Now I was just chastising my son. They went overboard and I'm going to punish them. The lesson is, even when God is unhappy with you and he hands you over for punishment, he will make sure you're not bruised beyond measure. He will still punish those who exceed their limits as they act on you. I will punish your enemies, says the Lord. I can hear someone saying, Amen. Those who have tormented you, God says, I will return. I will judge the nations because they have been too much on Israel. Number two, God says, I will return to Jerusalem and I will return with mercy. I will return mercifully. I will return with good news to it. And praise God. When God has chastised us, he comes back to us with mercy. And I pray that the Lord may visit you and me with mercy again. 
Number three, he says, when I return, my house shall be rebuilt in Jerusalem. You realize every chapter of Zachariah, God's heart is in the building of his house. God loves his house. God loves his house. That's why you are building the house of God, a place of worship, a place where people can run for refuge and meet God. But again, remember you are the house of God. You are God's habitation. So you never, you need to understand the two houses we are dealing with. The house of God, which is a physical structure where people come to assemble and do the ministry and meet one another. But there is also the house of God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit and God dwells in us. God says, my house shall be built. At MCC, we not only want to build a physical structure, but we believe in building people, in building the house of God, which is the Hekalu Yabwana, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, the life of a Christian. I will build my house on it. My house. By the way, God does not say, I understand this is English. God does not say, I will build my house. But he says, my house shall be built. God will revisit us in mercy, but someone will build the house of God. In this case, the task was on a man called Zerubbabel. And you could be the person to build the house of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then he says in number four, that uh, the survey line shall be stretched over Jerusalem and measurements shall be taken. You know, the word stretched means that Jerusalem shall be enlarged. Jerusalem shall be expanded. I can hear brothers and sisters who have been following us at MCC saying amen because 2020 for us at MCC is a year of enlargement and enlargement means that Jerusalem shall be bigger in size than it was when they went into captivity. Do you know every time God restores you? Do you know every time God revives you? He doesn't bring you back to where you are. But God enlarges you when he visits you again. That's why he says the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord. When God visits us, the glory becomes better. The building becomes bigger. I want to tell you, my dear friends, when God visits you a second time, when God comes to visit you, it will be bigger and it will be brighter. And that's why I'm prophesying with my eyes open that after the COVID-19 season, the church will be greater, better, stronger, more powerful. This season, let us use it to feed. Let us use it to refine. Let us use it to reset ourselves to factory uh, uh, settings because this uh, setback will be our bouncing back. We're going to bounce back in power. God is going to expand you and enlarge Jerusalem. It will be bigger. It will be better. Are you listening to me? Brother Elisha is saying that God is visiting you again and it will be stretched. It will be enlarged. Instead of one acre, it will be two acres, three acres, four acres. The glory of the latter house is going to be greater than the glory. Number five. He says, my cities, that is the cities of Jerusalem and Judah, Israel and Judah, all the cities. Now, it's no longer about Jerusalem, but he's saying all the cities will prosper. And as they prosper, they will spread. All the cities. Do you know Jerusalem is a city? But do you know God says that the church is his city? Do you know you are a city? Are you aware the scripture refers to you as a city? And if you are the city of God, God gives you a promise that it shall prosper you. Not one city, but many cities. Not only will he prosper you, but when you are prospered, you will spread. I pray. You know, I know some of you have an allergy for prosperity. I hear you even have some words called prosperity gospel. But I hear I read to you the word of God. God says the cities of the world prosper. So if you have an allergy for prosperity, may God have mercy on you. This is the Bible. The cities of the Lord 
shall prosper. Someone say amen. The cities of the Lord shall prosper. God's people shall prosper. And as they prosper, they shall spread abroad. They'll go to the rest of the world. God will prosper you and you will spread. I pray that somebody may put those words in their book and say, I shall prosper and spread. Number six, the Lord says, I will comfort Zion. Some of us have cried a lot. Job cried a lot. For some of us, life has been tears, sorrow, sadness. Yes, God says, I'll come and comfort you. I'll hold you in my arms. I'll wipe your tears away. God has a way of doing some things in your life that will make you forget your sorrow. Have you cried long? Have you suffered seven years? I prophesy to you, the Lord is going to visit you. The Lord will comfort you. Yes, he will comfort you. The Bible tells me in the book of Revelation that God will wipe away our tears. He will wipe away our tears. He will comfort us. I pray that in 2020, God may do something in your life that will wipe away all your tears. The tears of many years. God will comfort you. You have waited. You have trusted. Keep on praying. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. God will comfort you. Number seven. He says, I will choose Jerusalem again. I chose them the first time. I got mad with them. I threw them away. But like my loving wife, I will choose them again. I will never choose another bride. I will not replace Israel. I will choose them again. The good news is God is not planning to replace you. God is not planning to take your candle off. God is planning to choose you again. He's going to pick you a second time. You know, I followed uh, when Brother Benny Hinn had a divorce. And then I followed when he married again and he married the same wife he had divorced. God says, I will choose you again. You feel like God abandoned you. I have good news for you. God is choosing you again. Maybe you backslid. Maybe you ran away. You left the Lord. God never left you. God is saying, come back. I want to choose you again. You are mine one more time. And I love you. Dear brothers and sisters, those are promises. Seven promises that came in result to prayer. And God loves you. May these seven promises become fulfilled in your life. May God gloriously reward you. May God remember your tears. But dear brother and sister, let's stay on our knees. Let's be in prayer. During this shutdown and shut in, these quarantines and curfews, take advantage. Seek the Lord in prayer. Let the Lord do a miracle for us. Father, in the name that is above every name, we've been battered, we've been beaten, we've been knocked, we've been harassed and bruised. And yet we recognize you're our God. We arm back to you, Lord, and our cry is, how long? How long, Lord? Seventy years are over, Lord. Ten years have passed. How long? Dear Lord, how long, dear Lord, before you intervene? Hear us, see our tears, remember us. 
in Jesus name amen 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 god bless you have a great time see you tomorrow pray that we get electricity amen